this going. We have an action-packed evening of listening this evening. Um, I'd love everyone to uh, go ahead and give me your biggest smile if you can. Turn on your uh, video so we can take a snapshot, a zoom shot if that's all right. Would love that. So everybody say cheese. Cheese. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so while that is kind of a humorous start, we're really here for some serious deep listening. Um, so I am going to go ahead and I am going to share my screen and we'll just jump right into our work. So welcome this evening. Welcome to our Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee meeting on the I-205 and I-5 toll projects. I'm Christine Moses of Buffalo Cloud Consulting, and I'm your facilitator for this evening. And I'd like to introduce Penny Maybe as a co-host and Zoom manager. Hi, Penny. <laughs> so um, our purpose this evening is to listen and learn through reflection and discussion. And I hope to provide a, a, a venue for deep listening and that we really get to explore a lot of different issues this evening. And we're gonna do that through a reflection and, and discussion process. First, um, we'll do some technical information here, again, getting all of us acclimated to our Zoom controls. Brett is your go-to technical person, and you can see his email and his phone number. You might wanna jot those down so you have them with you. We'll be recording the entire meeting this evening, and so what you say is part of the public record. We'll be uh, making the recording available next week for public review, so that will live on the website. To find more information about the project, go to oregontolling.org. Community members, you're welcome to email your public comments to us at oregontolling at o.state.or.us. Uh, we will also have public comments at the end of this meeting. Now for our Zoom etiquette. EMAC members, please use your headphones to reduce background noise if you're in a noisy place. Make sure your name is spelled correctly, and I believe everyone's is there, so I really appreciate that. Um, and if it's not, please update it at this time. If I call on you, you'll need to unmute, so click the microphone at the bottom left um, to be heard. Ask questions by raising your virtual hand. Click on the participant to open the pane on the right-hand side, and then click raise hand on the lower right side. Penny will then unmute you when appropriate. Give me a thumbs up to know that uh, if you see the raise hand. Just want to make sure everybody sees that raise hand. If your video freezes or you drop off, you can close your, out your window and come back in again. And I discovered this awesome Zoom tip to see each other and the presentation at the same time. If you click on View Options at the top of your screen and select Side by Side, use the vertical line in the middle to be able to see both the presentation and the gallery view. Um, and, and it just, it's made my life so much easier and I actually love Zoom now. So I think I can do it all, yay. <laughs> so um, also I wanna let you know that the chat is disabled for attendees and participants. Um, we'll do our best to make sure that everyone gets a turn or I may ask, and call on you if you have not taken up space. So to agree, you can use hand signals like this um, if people are speaking and making points that you agree with. 
In terms of public comment, we're gonna have 10 minutes at the end of this meeting tonight. Community members, um, please raise your virtual hand if you would like to speak. We encourage public comments. You have up to two minutes, depending on the number of people who want to participate. If you provided written or verbal comments prior to 11 o'clock yesterday, we shared your comments with the EMAC in advance. So all of the EMAC members have received your comments. We will ensure that all written and verbal comments we receive prior to or at this meeting are included in the next meeting. Summary, all comments received after 11 a.m. the day before the meeting will be provided to the committee at the next meeting. You can submit written or verbal comments at any time by emailing oregontolling at odot.state.or.us with EMAC public comment in the subject line. Or feel free to call 503-837-3536 and state EMAC public comment in your message. So our agenda this evening, we'll start off with a land acknowledgement, then we'll review the, the agreements as we do at all of our meetings. We'll move into our reflection and discussion for about 90 minutes. Then we'll have some announcements, next steps, and then the public comment. So, the purpose of my land acknowledgement is to center the traditional native inhabitants of the land upon which we live. I want to respectfully acknowledge the Chinook, the Klatskanai, the Kalapulia, the Malala, the Tillamook, and the Siletz people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I pay my personal respects to their elders, both past and present. So our agreements, and I think we're just really going to lean into these over the um, next few months and, and truly live them as we do this work. So I, I really invite you to listen, believe, and reflect, and accept non-closure for the moment. We're gonna do big work this evening, as well as with our future meetings, and we may not come to closure, and, but I still ask you to be involved. Speak your own truth with compassion for yourself and for others. Listen to understand, don't listen to respond. And that's really a skill that we're going to be working on this evening, is really deep listening, active listening. Value and celebrate each other's experiences. Open hearts plus open minds gives us an opportunity to explore all sorts of different possibilities. Make space, take space, and then make space again. So be concise in your comments. Bring your best thinking into this room. You guys are an incredible group of experts and from the conversations I've had with each of you your passion is wonderful your expertise is amazing and I really hope that you bring all of that forward disagreement frustration and differences of opinion will be acknowledged explored and addressed so Again, I invite all of us for a thumbs up to make sure that we are in agreement with our agreements. Can I see that? Thank you. Thank you. So context for this evening. ODOT will listen and not necessarily respond to your questions unless you have a burning desire to have a response. I really want to give um, them an opportunity to listen deeply and to take lots of notes and to hear what you have to say. And Lucinda and Hannah will be at 
um, once we are finished with our reflection, they'll be able to summarize a little bit and then to give us some more information about the process and where we've been. Um, so I, I invite this as a listening session and we will have lots of active note takers to make sure that we record, again, re record and post this video. ODOT will be held accountable for the suggestions and requests from our group tonight that are within their purview. And I invite you to think deeply and ask probing questions, challenge assumptions, and push boundaries as we move forward. I will also center specific voices if I deem necessary. So let's get centered. I, I really um, believe that breathing <laughs> and really controlled deep breathing helps us center us right here and now so we can do this work. So I invite you to close your eyes or gaze softly downward. Feel the chair under your legs. Breathe in deeply through your nose, hold for a moment, and then breathe slowly out your mouth. Feel your hands in your lap. Breathe in deeply through your nose, hold for a moment, and then slowly breathe out through your mouth. Feel your feet firmly on the ground. Breathe in deeply through your nose. Hold for a moment and then slowly breathe out through your mouth. Slowly open your eyes and breathe normally. Welcome. So we're in our reflection and discussion process here. I invite you to take a minute and a half, and I will time that, to write in your journal or notebook and reflect on this question. Given where we are in the world at this moment, how do the demonstrations relate to the work of this committee? I'm going to time now and ask you to reflect for a minute and a half. I'm going to, at that point, then I will stop sharing and we will go, we will go into gallery view. Thank you. Ten seconds. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. 
we'll go into gallery view. Welcome everyone. So given where we are in the world at this moment, how do the demonstrations relate to the work of this committee? Go ahead, raise your hand. Hi, James. Hi. I think um, <clears throat> the uh, demonstrations are, no pun intended, a really good demonstration for us as far as the change that people really want to see. I think that the community is telling us that the status quo is definitely not what they're into hearing and that they want to see uh, change and they want to see change right away. And I think I hear that when I read some of the public comments um, that, you know, very different views and so forth. But I think that at the heart of it, it's um, people want to see change. Thank you so much. Uh, Philip. So I had to unmute myself there. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I just sort of tag along uh, what was just said. Um, you know, I think the demonstration sort of uh, reflect uh, a lot of pent up frustration uh, as a sign of, uh, you know, a lot of talking over uh, many, many, many years uh, with uh, essentially uh, good intent but essentially no impact. And so I think at, we're sort of at the point now where um, good intent is not enough. Uh, you know, good words aren't enough. So action is in fact uh, demanded and not only just action, but actual impact. So in other words, there have to be, um, you know, measurable outcomes, things that can clearly be seen as you know, impacting the community. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to you, Abe. How's everybody doing? Um, good to see you all. Um, for me, the demonstrations are connected to our work in a, in a really kind of metaphorical and symbolic way where a lot of the protests that I've seen have gone to the streets and stopped traffic along interstates. Um, which to me holds a lot of meaning as, as those being kind of historical symbols of disruption of communities and reminders of a process that hasn't taken account everybody's needs into the planning process. And so by seeing people fill those spaces that um, is, has, have been created by not um, incorporating everybody's feedback, it's kind of a, a symbol and, and uh, call to action that we all need to move together forward at the same pace to find solutions that meet everybody's needs. Um, and a, a reminder to me um, that we're not all in the same place and that we have different interests in the transportation space. Um, one of the really powerful images that I saw was the semi moving through a, a group of protesters. And that just to me is people walking versus freight. Um, so really being able to understand where everybody's opinions are are coming from and the goals and objectives that they have in um, developing transportation policy and space to be able to find solutions that meet everybody's needs moving forward. Thank you so much for that. Michael. Hi everyone, it's, um, it's good to see you all. Um, I think you know, this moment of increased awareness of racial injustice you know, really demands um, our attention to think about how past planning decisions have impacted, um, has impacted the black community, indigenous communities, um, people of color communities. And we, I think this is a moment for us to um, think through how we can address systemic transportation barriers um for 
for those communities um, and just really be um, mindful and critical of, you know, what is it that we, you know, would recommend to, to ODOT to do um, and thinking about the outcomes of those decisions and the impact that they'll have for um, years or decades to come. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? It's a pretty big question. Dwight? Can you unmute, please? All right, so I, I apologize for that. It was giving me a message I hadn't seen before. Anyway, um, when I look at the uh, demonstrations, the protests, um, I think what it reflects is a, an illness uh, that uh, has uh, been attached to this country for now 401 years. I think and I hope uh, that it symbolizes uh, that racism is on its, uh, as Dr. King would say, it's on its deathbed. Um, I hope that is the case this time. I'm old enough to look back through the vista of time to 19. 68, when a, uh, a great American, Dr. King, was assassinated, taken from us very, very selfishless, selfishly. And he talked about a deathbed, and, uh, and I see that. And, um, but he warned us at that time that uh, the only thing that had yet to be decided was how costly the funeral was going to be. And I think that's something that we need to be mindful of as we look at these things as we move forward. Um, everything we do comes at a cost. And uh, we are seeing that, and whether it is... Um, uh, the burning of buildings, um, the, the uh, uh, injury to, to uh, uh, human beings, um, these things come at a cost. Um, I think we're at a point, a reflection point, a tipping point, um, almost, it's almost revolutionary like. And, uh, and so I hope that we take our charge here very seriously and we look at these things and that we bring as much fairness, as much equity to this process as we can. Uh, I'm not about, I said that uh, a month ago, it's not about lip service for me at all. Uh, it's about making a difference and making a lasting difference. And again, I think um, the door is open and our charge is to be ready to enter that door. Um, and so I, I hope we will uh, endeavor to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, I think we can move on to the next question. We have a bunch of them. So I'm going to share my screen. So I invite you to take the next one and a half minutes to write in your journal or your notebook and reflect on this question. 
What are the historic injustices that ODOT has committed against communities of color, albinus specifically, and others in general? So I'll time this for a minute and a half, and then I invite us to have that conversation. Christine, can you put your screen in presentation mode, please? Yes. Thank you. Is that better? Yes, okay, thank you. Ten seconds. Yeah. All right. Back into gallery. What are the historic injustices that ODOT has committed against communities of color? albinus specifically, and others in general. Yes, James. I don't mean to talk too much, but um, I wouldn't describe myself as a historian by any means. Um, but uh, I grew up in the Albina neighborhood and I couldn't give you dates or statistics, but I think that the first word that comes to mind is displacement and displacement in the form of, you know, building I-5 through or the construction uh, around the convention center and um, the Coliseum. Um, you can also see examples, even with the uh, light rail going up interstate um, and how that leads to more gentrification and dislocation of the residents and not taking them into account. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of policies and decisions that all, you know, you know piece by piece um, have dismantled the African-American community that um, was flourishing um, before my time um, in North and Northeast Portland, especially after Van Port and um, different displacements that way. And so, you know, when you go beyond just the Albina neighborhood and you start looking at other um, communities, poor communities, communities of color, and how the infrastructure isn't in place, you look at East County, and how many challenges that out in East County they have with bus service and the roads and no sidewalks. And that is to me, um, those are to me examples of, um, you know, poor communities and black communities being, um, not being brought to the table and not being considered um, with these development projects. That's my two cents. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. I see that we have um, Patrick who has raised his hand, who is not part of the EMAC committee. So Patrick, I'm gonna invite you to say your, um, what you would like to say during the public comment. So hang in there, but I invite you to, to 
participate in the public comment later on. Yes, Kari. Hey, everybody. It's really great to see you all. Um, I was nodding my head along to everything everything one was saying at the previous question and um also nodding my head along with everything james was just saying and so i really um 100 agree with that i think um you know really the things that i had written down was really around not just displacement but really dividing the community both literally and figuratively um and also in um you know some of the things that uh, led to displacement around taking of property and things like this. Um, I think, you know, thinking about, you said, whose voices, who's at the table, I think really, um, I feel like there's been an, uh, historically an explicit um, focus on the, the voices and, and people in the white community who have been invited to the table, who have been prioritized um, in what their needs are. Uh, and others have been either not allowed at the table or their needs have been ignored. And I think that does continue. Um, and it really has resulted in, um, in not building or in investing in a comprehensive transportation system um, outside of what happened in Albina. But I think generally in the, in the transportation, transportation system at large, um, not building, not investing in a system that is accessible, that is affordable, that meets the needs of people in the community. Um, and I think, you know, just to harken back to the previous question, I think one of the things that I'm seeing um, from the demonstrations is that this is, um, this is not something new. This is, you know, all, all of these things that are, are coming up, folks have been thinking about and talking about and figuring out these things for a long time. They've been saying it and nobody's been listening. And I think that's what we're seeing in a lot of the demonstrations is that there's a lot of solutions out there. They just haven't been listen to and um, I think that is relevant here too. Thank you so much. Philip. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and I, I just want to piggyback again on what what James and Kari just said. You know, I'm, I'm not a historian either. So the, the timeline is, is, is a little murky to me. But, um, you know, again, going back to a comment I made earlier were around intent. You know, and and sort of the intention of how <clears throat> I five was originally constructed and where it was constructed. You know, I don't know what ODOT's intent was, especially in in you know in collaboration with with, with federal transportation planning. But um, I've read that in other uh, metropolitan jurisdictions, uh, there was a time when highways were on purpose built through the middle of cities as a way of trying to eliminate quote urban blight unquote which could be a code word for essentially trying to eliminate certain communities uh and um uh you know and and and, and so whether or not that was a quote explicit or even implicit unquote intent on the part of ODOT in this particular example around I-5, I think is, is perhaps debatable. But, you know, I think this all goes back to the whole question of intent. And to me, that is a, a, a pretty significant example of injustice uh, that I don't think has ever been explicitly acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you so much. Diana, I saw your head nodding and... <laughs> um, interestingly enough, uh, about a week or so ago, there was a fascinating article in the LA Times about the LA freeways are the most racist California monuments. And the article references how um, those federal dollars that came into the Southern California area during a specific time 
years, like 1920s, 30s, their intentions were very deliberate in terms of segregating and separating communities. And as we have seen these demonstrations time and time again of the dismantling and the destruction of monuments around the country, there is some, there is movement in Southern California about what would that look like, dismantling segments of the, their, their, their freeway systems. Um, and, um, you know, it will, as we know, um, it's not only it's not only separating and segregating communities, um, but we all know that it is our poorest communities of color who continue to um, suffer the most from 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 these segregated and and racially motivated policies. And you know, right now that we're talking about transportation and freeway construction through neighborhoods you know, um, the, the health outcomes of, of, of our communities who are impacted by, by these freeways um, and, and children who are directly exposed to, to freeway pollution, you know, um, have um, uh, higher rates of asthma and, and, and at times children suffer um, um, unnatural cognitive um, um issues um so kind of full circle to to um the demonstrations this is a wake-up call for at least for me as part of this committee to keep all of those pieces on the forefront as we have these conversations and hold myself accountable to hopefully get it right. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Amanda, anybody else want to chime in on this? So this is John. I don't know. I can go after Amanda. I forgot to do the hand. That's okay. Uh, no, I mean, I, I agree. I think there are a lot of environmental justice issues with um, and social injustice issues and racism with the development of a big portion of the freeway system. And um, potentially there are other things that uh, ODOT has developed that I, I, I don't know about intent, but I, um, at least my uh, impression is that consideration of communities of color wasn't even part of the conversation historically. And so uh, did, did they set out to intentionally develop something exclusive? I don't know, but I don't think they were trying to be inclusive. And I, I think that was a standard practice. And I think that's how a lot of our country was built. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go to John and then I'll go to Park. Yeah, thank you. I, I was just going to say there is so much information about what happened to the community that I would encourage the staff to maybe send a couple just small articles out to folks like Bleeding Albina and a history of community disinvestment or just sort of the fact that ODOT did destroy 300 homes and never replaced those homes. And those are homes owned primarily by African American families. So, I mean, I think that might just be helpful to the community members, just some quick data points or some of the literature that would kind of bring everybody to the same place. Uh, and it would be quick reading, but to give folks context for, I think someone, um, Amanda said, how do we help this process not repeat itself uh, in a different format? So that's what I was gonna say. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Park? Yes, I'm thinking of the effect um, of the economic decisions that are made. When, when they're picking routes for freeways, there's a natural tendency to, look at what land could be procured cheap, cheapest. And so what, what you're doing is you're tending to, uh, to wipe out more low income or, or medium income 
neighborhoods than than if you uh, went went to the higher priced land. So uh, I'm, I'm not. That's more of an economic decision rather than anybody deciding to go against one community. But it has the same result in the end in a lot of cases. I appreciate the discussion of intent versus impact that comes back many, many times and in many different ways. So I appreciate the nuanced conversation around that. Anyone else on this question? Okay, back to the next question then. So again, take a minute and a half to write in your journal and or your notebook. And um, I'll set a timer. So how does current transportation policy contribute to inequitable outcomes? I invite you to explore that question. Ten seconds. Welcome back. So again, our question is, how does current transportation policy contribute to inequitable outcomes? Ishmael, I haven't heard from you yet. Would you like to step in? Yeah, I couldn't find the raise your hand button. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, on a federal level, it's easier and it's more robust to get funding to build new roads than it is to just maintain the systems that we have and improve those. So that just encourages transportation systems to just build new roads, impact environments and communities rather than maintaining and improving the systems that we currently have and utilizing those funds for, you know, public transportation or multimobility uh, options. So, I mean, just in a federal level, it's states and transportation agencies are encouraged to build something new and keep expanding and not have a plan to maintain and improve the things we currently have. So that's uh, one way we contribute to inequitable outcomes. Thank you for that. Abe. Um, first of all, I think this is a huge, huge question. And to, to me, definitions are really important. So I think um, just being cognizant of transportation policy can mean a lot of different things and inequitable outcomes can mean a lot of different things. I tend to put them in two buckets very generally, just kind of 
process equity outcomes and uh, and um, outcome outputs and outcomes out, outputs and outcomes related to equity. Um, some process related uh, actions that can contribute to inequitable outcomes, uh, not incorporating enough feedback early enough in the process of planning projects and policy, um, not pausing to understand what unintended consequences may be, um, not using shared language to identify what common goals, uh, the vision for a project, uh, shared outcomes, um, and not using an intersectional approach, so acknowledging that transportation is connected to housing and connected to social equity. Uh, you. you have teed us up for the equity framework which will be coming next month so excited <laughs> thank you for those observations michael hi i just wanted to build on the the answers that i've been hearing and um, the current policy, you know, really um, prioritizes um, cars and it doesn't support a healthy ecosystem of transportation choices. And so we've built um, a system where like, you, you, like a car is sort of the default answer. It's the only um, way to go. And that is a big cost for um, a lot of um, poor individuals or communities. And so it leaves those communities behind. Um, and so when I just think about that, that piece there, um, it's sort of providing a subsidy and paying um, for a, a system that is um, expensive to get access to. And so it's like putting up this barrier um, that is very difficult for um, the poor to be a part of. Thank you, Michael. Phil Ditzler, I'm gonna invite you to step in to this conversation if you like. You know, Christine, I do appreciate that. I am, uh, like ODOT, though, very much uh, focused on listening. <laughs> you know, of course, I have some thoughts, but I think it's better if I just listen. Christine, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bill, I invite you to step in. Uh, so this made me think about one of the public comments that I was reading um, from the document that was sent earlier. And in regards to tolling and sort of horizontal equity in the sense that when you're tolling you're putting burdens on populations and the ones who are most likely to experience the burden or have the heaviest burden are low income or um, people of color sort of populations and when an equitable system tries to address that they most often do not provide uh, methods that are going to meet those needs such as providing transit subsidies to a population who may not use transit or something along those lines. Um, so that's sort of where my mind was going in regards to this. Thank you so much. Yes. James. Yeah. So my internet connection is not that great, so I'm sorry if you can't hear me. Um, but I also think, um, kind of going back to what Park said, and when ODOT does the cost-benefit analysis and needs to pull all the numbers together to make a project go, I think that ODOT hides behind the rules and regulations by saying, well, that's what's required, and so therefore we're doing it this way when and i'm not sure how um, the community impact um, factors into the decisions that are made at odot and you know from the outside and i have no visibility into odot and so i see odot as being somewhat opaque and 
And I think that, that opaqueness is what also were made. And when you don't have answers, you come up with answers. And then you see examples of ODOT, ODOT projects that we've talked about, which don't um, have an equity lens that was used on them. And I think that, so to me, the, the biggest challenge of ODA is the opaqueness of how ODA does its business. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Philip. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, I think I want to just repeat, uh, perhaps using different words, what others have already said, which is I, I think historically, uh, transportation policy has been inequitable uh, because it hasn't been holistic uh, and hasn't really taken into consideration all of the other, quote, uh, vital conditions for well-being, unquote, otherwise known as the social determinants of health. And, uh, you know, so this, the, the, the focus on roads, the focus on cars as really being the primary goal um, you know, operates in a silo almost to the exclusion of all of those other important elements that, that are really important for people and communities' well-being. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Fabian, I'm gonna invite you to take up some space. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, I think I, Similar to what everybody's thinking, I think when an equity framework isn't implemented um, with policy, it's, it's hard to um, fix or produce something that isn't going to produce more systemic inequities. So we end up pushing people from their homes and moving them to an area where they can't afford. But then the problem becomes once they move there, how are they going to get to their jobs that's either in a city, for example, um, they're gonna have to find public transportation if they don't have a car because they can't afford one. Uh, but then if there is no public transportation where they move, then that complicates things. So I think really implementing a um, equity framework kind of avoids these things. And this is why you see demonstrations, right? Because they've had to endure that and it's just like, we can't take it anymore. Um, so yeah, I think that that's why it's super important that we implement that and I'm happy that we're, we're working on this together. Thank you so much. Uh, Park and then Diana. Yeah, since this question is quite broad, I'm gonna go to the national level. Um, we have for the last 50 years really emphasized air travel and terribly neglected rail. And that's kind of the opposite of what Europe has done. And uh, rail turns out to be a, a much more efficient and lower cost. So more, it's available to more people and it's a lot less polluting. Um, so that was just something that at the national level we could have done dram dramatically differently. Thank you for that observation. Diana, then Amanda. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> you would think after all this time, um, which, which brings me to kind of what I want, it, it, what I'm gonna say resonates and, and um, well, let me say what folks are saying resonates and I, completely concur I, and it makes me wonder um, in this current environment that we are all experiencing with staying at home and how our shopping habits have changed and how restaurants some are open some are closed um, hotel industry is at a stop um, and, and I'm thinking of all the folks who are on that, um, what I call a, a direct service kind of work. Um, 
and how they are impacted by this pandemic and the stay-home orders and the loss of jobs and the reduction of workforce and furloughs. With all of that in mind, this is the commute. These are the communities who will be mostly impacted by a toll, whatever that toll is. That I feel that these are the, the these communities will be carrying and shouldering that burden the most. And it makes me wonder: Is it the right time to be talking to to be thinking about a toll? when these families are the ones who I think of many families in Southwest Washington, particularly our black and Latino families who cross that bridge daily to access work. And one family in mind, just this weekend, I learned that this Latino undocumented father of three drives every day into Gresham to see if there's work available. Some days there is work, another day there isn't. And it made me really think about this, 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 this father of three. If there was a toll right now, how that would impact the well-being of his family. Do I put gas? and keep money aside for toll? Or do I put diapers? And I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling right now knowing how a toll could very well devastate families across not only the Portland metro area, but the impact it has even far beyond um, far beyond into, into Southwest Washington as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amanda. So I was thinking um, about transparency and I think one of the things that um, at least my observation is that we, uh, we are very good at being transparent and I think part of that is challenged by just the nature of long range planning uh, and the and the system that we have created. So I think what we do, you know, as a community engagement person, we tend to look at the spectrum at what, you know, how much influence do people actually have? And then we gauge our messaging based on that. So in some instances, people may have a lot of influence on a decision. And in some instances, the decision was made 20 years ago, and now we're just trying to uh, communicate that to people. And I think the fact that that spectrum exists is intrinsic in the inequity and, and the larger problem with the system. So instead of saying, oh, here's this decision that we've already made, it was very expensive to come to this decision years ago and now we wanna implement it and we want some community input on how we wanna implement it and we go to the community and they don't want that, we don't stop, right? We just change the messaging to try to get people on board and that to me is a is part of this larger inequity problem. And I think the system doesn't allow for that. Right? That's not my job is not to stop the project and, and rethink it. It's to get the community on board. And sometimes that's really disingenuous. And um, I and I think that that's just how things are. And that doesn't necessarily mean that's how they need to be. I think we're at a really good time and place to be thinking about things differently um, but but I struggle with that and I think you know we can say oh we are trying really hard to be transparent but I, I think that's not very deep the transparency is not very deep thank you thank you for that um I think we are doing really good on time this evening and so I'm going to call an audible and give us a five minute break. So if everybody wants to turn off your microphone and your video for five minutes, so come back at 6.38, um, that'll be great.
Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. It's always nice to just step away for a couple of seconds and um, get a drink of water and come right back into it. So we're going to go into our next question. So I'm going to share my screen. Can tolls be equitable or what would equitable tolls look like? Again, you have a minute and a half to reflect and to take notes, and then we'll come back together for a conversation. Ten seconds. All right. Can tolls be equitable? Or what would equitable tolls look like? Who would like to start us off? Amanda. Um, so I, I struggle with this question. I, don't, I, I hope I'm not the only one struggling with this question. Um, but I, I feel like there must be some way to, to make tolls equitable, like a sliding scale or something like that. But I feel like when I think about that, it's I can't get to a point of this is 100% equitable. I can, I can only get like sort of equitable. What do you mean by that, Amanda? Well, I feel like uh, when I think about other types of programs that ha that try to address equity, uh, other fee-based programs that try to ad address equity, you can only get so far, right? Because in this particular instance, you need to uh, have a car or some type of transportation that would put you on a on a road with it. You know, they'll put you on I five in the first place, and so there's some. There, like right off the bat, there are some issues with, okay, how do we make this something that anyone, uh, anyone can, can utilize or get through or, you know, how, how is this accessible? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what I mean. Like, it, you know, like there are these huge hurdles to come to before you even get to the point of just the logistics of like, how do we make this a thing that costs money that, that everyone can do? I appreciate the clarity. Thank you for that. So then I'm going to go to 
Bill, and then Michael, and then Kari. So Bill, you're up. I think currently the answer is no. And I think that's because we don't have alternative transportation options that will provide you the convenience of owning a car. So if you're putting a burden on using a vehicle, but there's no alternatives that provide the same level of access or comfort or mobility, I, I don't see how it could work. Also, I'd like to state that a minute and a half is a, not a lot of time to think about it. So that's just my minute and a half answer. <laughs> what, you don't have a dissertation yet? Come on, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> it's certainly um, a big question and I think, um, Bill hit on something that really resonates with me, um, is that word mobility. And um, I think I, sh I shared at the last meeting that um, I, um, I work with the, uh, at the Portland Bureau of Transportation and one of the projects I'm on is the pricing options for equitable mobility. And it is a group that has convened a community task force and they have dug into this question of what does equitable mobility look like? Um, and if you type in um, equitable mobility framework and Portland Bureau of Transportation, um, it should pull it up. But essentially the, you know, the group came together and thought about um, like what would a vision for equitable mobility look like? And then all of the, the comments were pulled together um, and grouped into these bigger buckets of moving people and goods, um, sustainability and health, safety and economic opportunity. And um, each of these categories had different topics of things um, that the task force cared about. And that, include thing, that includes things like efficiency, transportation affordability, availability, reliability, connectivity, accessibility, quality. I'll just read through the rest of them. Um, climate impact, air quality, health impact, traffic safety, personal safety, um, and then job creation, working conditions, and a connected thriving and local economy. And I just wanted to bring um, attention to all of those, all of those items um, because it kind of takes, um, I guess it goes sort of um, a level up from like, can tolling be equitable, be equitable and is talking about like, what does it mean if we have uh, truly um, equitable mobility system um, that works for people. And then um, tolling may or may not play a role in that, but like um, that's kind of informing kind of how um, I think about like, where is it that we wanna be? And then um, that brings into question like, you know, does tolling play a role in that system? Um, because like people um, have been saying, you know, when we think about transportation affordability um, for, for folks who, you know, have a car and like that's how they're getting around and would be really burdened by um, a toll. Um, I think that makes us question like, how, how can we make transportation more affordable um, for, for folks, but in a larger sort of general sense and not just zoning in and like, how can we make driving by car more affordable? Or in the case of tolling, it's sort of pushing that lever of like making that more ex expensive. Um, so it's just kind of, um, I guess what I'm saying is like, I just kind of think it's important to take that one step up and think about the whole system. Um, and taking, that, taking a look at that perspective. Thank you for that observation. Thank you for pulling us back up, up, up into the system's vision across um, the larger system. So I appreciate that, Michael. Hari? Um, yeah, at one, first I wanted to say that I, I need to hop off the, the meeting after this comment, so um, I'm sorry that I won't be missing the last part of the call. Um, but very much along the lines of what Michael was just saying, um, on a level, it is inequitable to not be 
pricing the system. Um, I think that not charging for our roadways, um, despite all of the investment that is has gone into them, and I think especially when we talk about sort of the historic um, investments, sorry if you can all hear my children screaming in the background, um, historic investments and where they were prioritized and, and who benefited from those historically. So um, thinking about uh, some of those pieces, but um, I think that when we think about whether tolls could be equitable, I think that the answer is yes. And I think it is really hard to think about and figure out what that would look like. And I sort of imagine that there's, um, there's maybe like a short term and kind of more of a long term uh, things to think about there. But I think, um, you know, one of those is absolutely looking at, um, you know, what does it look like for folks who rely on the system and really um, do not have the means to be able to afford a toll and the impact that that will have on their families and finding a way to adjust that through, you know, uh, income taxes, or rebates or, or something, some system that um, allows for a little bit of balance there. I think that's one piece of it. And then I think the, the other piece of it, and there's probably more, but these are the two that came to my mind. Um, the other one is, is similar um, in how do we mitigate uh, the impact of the tolls on people in the community? What are we, either using the revenue from the tolls for or other revenues from the transportation system um, that may or may not be constrained by policy decisions right now, but um, are we mitigating the impact by investing in transit operations? Are we improving transit? So that person that uh, Diana was talking about, you know, who's coming over from Vancouver into Gresham actually has an option uh, to be able to to make that trip that doesn't require them getting in a car and tolling. I don't know if that works, but you know, thinking about the different trips and how they could be, um, how the whole transportation system could be mitigated in a different way, so that um, the impact of the toll on that particular trip um, doesn't have to be an impact, and that there's other options that are viable options that will allow people to be able to do what they need to do, and that that's seen as part of part of the whole process of tolling, that there is this mitigation that comes into play um, around um, making the transportation system as a whole better and work better and be more accessible and more affordable for everyone. And, and thinking outside of um, just what it means to be getting in a car. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else on this question? Abe? I guess I would add just uh, quickly to the end of those comments that I think the adaptability of a tolling system is an important part of, of how equitable it is and that it can constantly be assessing um, who benefits and who impacts and making adjustments to make sure that those are still aligned. That, that's an interesting thing to remember as we continue this conversation, that it can be adaptable. Yeah, yeah this is John, and I somehow cannot figure out how to raise my hand, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, John, are you on a phone? I'm on a surface. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll switch to a phone. Maybe that's easier. <laughs> All I was going to say is I think, I think Carver's on to something. I mean, to me, it's a scale. And, and if, if you are, if we're open to a, that scale starting with zero and going to whatever that future uh, potential cost could be, then it can be equitable, right? So whether it's zero or it's subsidized or whatnot, there, there, is a, there is a path here. It's just, what does that look like? You know, and I think that's what this conversation is for. Yes, yeah, broad thinking. That's what I'm asking for. Very good, which is going to roll us into our next question that I am going to share my screen for. How can tools create benefits for everyone? What would that look like? 
So again, a minute and a half, um, and then we'll have our conversation. Please jot this down in your notes. Ten seconds. Okay. How can tools create benefits for everyone? What would that look like? I'm going to get comfortable with quiet. <laughs> when in fact, I'm really uncomfortable with quiet. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Ishmael. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I'll get to the benefit. I think Oda would not consider toll successful if folks just avoided freeways and took side roads and caused congestion and are just displacing cars and other, I don't think anybody would view that as a success, but you use the toll money to provide those folks other options to get around if tolling and taking the freeway is not an option. And those tolls, sorry about the background noise, uh, um, using the, the funds from tolling to provide folks other transportation options so the folks who are taking and driving another way to get around to work, to school, wherever it is, but also benefits folks who just live in those communities who do take transit. So adding benefits to the folks who, you know, are driving, but then also choose not to drive, and then the folks who just, who are already using transit and depend on it, need a better transit system to begin with. So using the funds to improve transportation mobility options. Um, yeah. Yeah, again, if you just toll and people start taking streets, that's not a win-win for anybody, but using the funds to give people actual options, especially those who are transit dependent. Yes, diversion is not good. <laughs> Michael? Um, I was just going to kind of um, piggyback off of that and just, you know, I guess state that like complementary strategies, I think are really um, essential and um, I, I think Ismail really hit on like you know improved um, transit if that's like increased frequency and really making it an attractive option um, you know helps um, people get where they need to go efficiently and it also makes um, space on the highway um, for for folks who do need to drive um, to also be efficient and so I think those are some some um, benefits that, that come to mind. Thank you, Michael. 
Park, I'm going to put you on the spot because you and I talked about um, some pretty innovative ways um, of creating community transportation communities, volunteers that help each other, um, van pools, that kind of stuff. So I'd, I'd kind of like to hear what you have to say. Can I put you on the spot? Is that okay? Can I ask you to unmute? <laughs> Shall I try and unmute you? Hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Okay, are. thank you. Uh, yes, I'm, I worked with uh, carpools and van pools in uh, the Seattle area and uh, see those as, a, as one of the possible mitigating factors. Um, turns out that uh, once, once a group of people, five, ten people, start van pooling together, um, they enjoy it. They become friends. Um, there were van pools that had been driving together for 20 years. Um, and carpools, the same thing, can be, uh, can be a very positive thing. So uh, it's, it's, it's not the only answer. Transit is obviously a big, a big part of it, but it, there, there, carpools and van pools could be a significant piece of the, uh, mitigation and, um, giving people alternatives, which is, which is one way you can, you can get to fairness. Thank you for that. Um, I was I was also really struck by um, the you know using apps to create less trips. So using an app to be able to have um, uh, me go get groceries for my neighbor at the same time. So I was wondering if you could speak to some of that that work that you have done around that? Yes, uh, carpools have traditionally been thought of as, as being uh, work trips. Mm -hmm. And we brainstormed up in Seattle and said, uh, doesn't have to be that way. Um, the, any a wedding, a funeral, a uh, baseball game, uh, whatever it is, um, people could carpool to that and uh, get a lot of vehicles off the road. People save money, make friends with their neighbors. Um, so we started thinking that, um, you know, the, the biggest impediment is, is um, people don't want to carpool with strangers. So you look to organizations, churches, um, people who graduated from your high school, people who graduated from your college, um, any connection that um, now with technology, we, we can use these things to connect people together and, and find, uh, you know, if I'm heading off to the grocery store, maybe I can check and see if there's a neighbor who wants to go to the grocery store too. Um, and, and so we could create a society where people just thought in terms of sharing rides a lot more. And again, it's, it's, it's not the big answer. It's, it's a piece, but um, talking to the highway engineers, you know, if you can start talking about getting 3% or 5% of the cars off a road, those are, those are big numbers. Um, so uh, that's kind of my dream that uh, we, we, we get to a point where we we're willing to share rides a lot. Um, I was at a conference one time and talking with a guy doing the spiel and he said, well, I'm not going to ride with a stranger. And I said, well, would you ride to somebody coming to this conference? And he said, oh, well, yeah, anybody who's in this industry and is coming to this conference, I'd be interested in meeting. You know? 
So there are there are ways of making connections. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that part. Thank you so much, Diana. So, <clears throat> um, um, I've been reading some other um, newspaper uh, uh, stories in different uh, newspapers around the country. Um, not intentionally, just kind of they've been popping up here and there. I think the universe is trying to tell me something. Um, but in terms of tolls and um, uh, can it can it create benefit for everyone? Um, there's a there's an interesting project happening. I don't know what part of the country it's happening. I can't remember the article, but they're experimenting with tolls um, toll rates at different hours of the day based on the volume of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, it, it, and the reason that they're, if I remember correctly about the article, I think that the reason they were experimenting, they were, they were piloting this, was to see the impacts and also mitigate the impacts for low income, Commute, how it would impact low income communities. Um, I will I will do my best to try to find that article um, and share it with the group. But I thought it was quite interesting, the different times and different toll prices. Um, and and lastly, I'm gonna have to jump off the call because I got a pressing issue here at home. But thank you, it's such a delightful and passionate conversation and looking forward to our next meeting so thank you thank you so much really appreciate it bye-bye uh fabian and then eduardo yeah i think um thank you christine i think some of the benefits are obviously um it's a cost-effective way of, of funding our our infrastructure and our roads and um also i think that it's going to promote safety and um you know better quality of the roads as well as um i know like with the technology that we have now with tolling we don't need to stop so i think you know being able to just go is going to be um, another benefit for everybody who's sharing the roads thank you eduardo Thank you. Yeah, I think in, in an ideal world, uh, reducing pollution in neighborhoods, uh, schools, and workplaces would be a benefit for everyone. Uh, but that is only if uh, tolling is matched with uh, incentivizing the use of public transportation, which is something that others uh, have already said. Uh, you know, does tolling force uh, people of color onto, you know, adapting their schedule to a public transit schedules, uh, while people already um, more able to move around more freely, uh, you know, continue to use their vehicle. Um, and then thinking also for my fellow Southwest Washingtonians is that uh, does tolling also benefit, you know, CTRAN? Um, and does it make it more accessible? You know, do we make it more accessible for people coming in uh, from Vancouver? Because the two options should not be paying $5 daily, uh, you know, to ride the max for over an hour into downtown Portland, you know, after you make the connection, or 770 to ride the express route um, in, into downtown Portland for a much shorter commute. So I would hope that uh, ODOT um, considers that, you know, in, in this project. So connecting both sides of that bridge. Absolutely. You know, the region is uh, too interconnected to, to not uh, consider that. Mm -hmm. Ishmael. Yeah, um, this is kind of also a question to 
and they could also just like create. Have, have you all questioned why they're driving to where they need to drive? You know, that living wage job is not in Vancouver, but in Gresham or in the across the region. Why is that the case? Why is there not more living wage jobs in your communities of access to grocery stores and schools? And so that, you know, you know, we require a framework, but um, encouraging communities to become more whole and provide the things that everybody needs and not necessarily have to travel. Obviously, it's not going to eliminate all sorts of travel, because, but um, providing folks more opportunities locally and closely to their neighborhood, neighborhood. So, again, not having to travel across the region just to have a living wage job, and maybe those living wage jobs can exist in those communities and neighborhoods. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Okay, I'll share my screen. We have uh, just a couple more questions here. So what are the metrics that demonstrate to you that ODOT is doing things differently? And so I, I, Metrics, indicators, signals that demonstrate that ODOT is doing things differently. So a minute and a half. And I'll be back to you. Ten seconds. Okay. What are the metrics, signals, um, that demonstrate to you that ODOT is doing things differently? Philip? Yes, uh, there are two things I would like to see. Uh, one is, uh, and I don't know if ODOT's ever said this before, or if they've said it uh, in a rather, um, uh, in an unclear fashion, but I would like to see ODOT come out with a statement that says, it is dedicated to reducing VMT by a certain percentage. Let's say, 10%. Can you, can you do, do you oh, uh, vehicle miles travel. Yeah, okay, I'm like. Okay. So in other words, ODOT says, we are committed to reducing vehicle miles traveled by 10% in five years. And the signal that that sends is that they are not intending to encourage more cars to be on the road. And so reducing VMT is a major factor in helping to reduce CO2 emissions, benefiting climate, and so forth. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, tolling is both revenue generating and it's a transportation demand management tool. Uh, and I would like to see ODOT say, 
whatever revenues we collect, we will devote, let's say, 50% to alternative forms of transportation, 50% to roads, or some such very specific uh, um, um, uh, percentage. Uh, because typically, you know, when, when uh, active transportation or alternative transportation gets supported, it's a, fr a small fraction of the total amount of dollars that are devoted to roads. And so I think to come out and say, we will support a much greater percentage of that for alternative forms of transportation would be a different way of thinking for ODOT. Thank you. Dwight, I haven't heard from you in a while. Do you like to bring your voice forward? All right, there I am having a little trouble unmuting here. I'll bring the camera back up. Um, you know, I've been working with ODOT now for about three and a half years. And so I don't have the history uh, that uh, people spoke about earlier. Um, what I can say is that um, I have, at least since I've been here, I've seen some meaningful change in, I think, leadership. Uh, I think I've seen some uh, restructuring. Um, I think what ODOT uh, has suffered from and probably continues to suffer from, but it's not a problem that is unique to ODOT as I have uh, found since my arrival three and a half years ago. Um, there is a lack of uh, diversity uh, here in uh, this area. And so I have lived in Chicago and Washington, D.C. I've lived in Las Vegas and Los Angeles. I've lived in uh, Central California. I could go on and on. And I have not, in my uh, travels, uh, landed anywhere that lacks the diversity of uh, this area here. And so, um, Having not known the history, and I was embarrassed uh, uh, prior to coming here, I didn't know the history of Oregon, and now I have since studied it. And, uh, and so I, I have some level of understanding now as to why, and now I'm speaking as an uh, African-American person, why uh, my people haven't uh, uh, found their way here or stayed here. Uh, it is uh, not at all uh, surprising to me. So I say that to say I have seen some movement in that area as, o, as it relates to ODOT. Uh, whether it will be enough to, to uh, move, the, move the ball down uh, the field uh, toward that ultimate goal uh, or touchdown, if you will, if I could use a football analogy, I you know, it's, it's been this long, and so I, uh, I regret uh, to, uh, to say that uh, it will probably be a bit longer before we arrive. Like I said, uh, this issue, this region suffers from a lot of things, and the one, like I said, that uh, continues to uh, to uh, show itself to me almost on a daily basis is the, the lack of diversity. And I don't know uh, exactly what the answer is because I think the framers of Oregon had something in mind when they set this thing up uh, uh, years and years or centuries ago. I don't know how old Oregon is, but I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate. It really is unfortunate. And um, unless we do something about that, I think uh, 
I hate to say we're doomed because that, that, that sounds defeatist, but uh, it's a huge problem here that doesn't exist in other places that I've been. So, I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, I got a lot off my chest right there. Very good. I really appreciate that. It's all connected. Community is connected. So I appreciate you bringing that forward. Anyone else on this? Abe? I guess one thought that would, or one, one action that would signal to me that, that ODOT was on a different course um, kind of connects to one of the earlier questions around the injustices that have been done. Um, similar to what other folks said, I'm not a historian and I don't have a deep knowledge of all of the things that have occurred in um, the transportation policy planning realm in our region. And uh, I think it would be an interesting um, signal of accountability of both good actions and bad actions that have occurred over the past for ODOT to look into that. And whether that's in the format of some report or some statement to identify what has happened and moving forward will be different. Um, or start to understand how those actions have put us in the place where we're at today where inequities exist and identify solutions to move forward with um, those injustices that have occurred. Thank you, Abe. Very thoughtful. Uh, Bill, yes, sir. Um, I don't know quite how to say what I want to say or I don't, but I think it's just sort of ODOT's interactions with residents of Southwest Washington. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a very touchy subject, but also it's difficult because you're asking one, a state agency in another state to communicate with residents in another state. Um, but Southwest Washington uses and participates in Portland quite a lot. And I think it would be unfortunate for their voices maybe to not be as heard as others. Um, I don't know, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Needs to be included, identified and included in this process. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm going to go on to our last question. Are there questions, concerns, needs, fears that must be addressed in order for you to effectively work on this committee? You have a minute and a half to jot this down in your journal or notebook, and then we'll come back. Ten seconds.
I know my mouse is in there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions, concerns, needs, fears that must be addressed in order for you to effectively work on this committee? Bill? Just echoing my last comment, the needs of Southwest Washington to be represented. I feel like we could easily get overlooked because this is an Oregon Portland project. Thank you for that. Centering Southwest Washington in the conversation. Yes, Eduardo. I think just moving forward, um, being able as a as a commissioner to uh, track the progress of how the conversations in this committee are influencing uh, the process of the project, um, and just receiving updates uh, beyond the meeting invites and notes. Uh, that's important. Very good. So tracking the progress and uh, kind of defining the influence that this committee has on the process. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Philip? Yeah, um, I, I think on one of the very first slides, I think under context for our conversation, one of the first bullets is that ODOT will listen, but not necessarily respond to our questions. And while I think I understand that bullet in the context of this particular session, um, I kind of view uh, advisory committees like this as functioning in a two-way street sort of process. So I'm assuming that when you when we say ODOT will listen but not necessarily respond, that that's not necessarily going to be the working assumptions going forward. So in other words, I expect that we will have some kind of feedback uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a one-way street, and I think that would be deadly. Yeah, yeah. No, those were the ground rules for this one. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It needs to be two-way. It, it absolutely must. Park, are you uh, raising your hand here? Yes. Go right ahead. Um, it's not necessarily a problem, but it's, I guess, a, I'll call it a challenge. We're, we're really, we're the committee, we've got ODOT, but then there's the Transportation Commission, and then there's the legislature, and they're all going to be involved in the final resolution. So it's just important that whatever messages we have get carried through all of those organizations. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, um, Vice Chair Simpson was unable to attend this evening. But in general, I believe he'll be in this process. Dwight? I think I've got it unmuted now. Um, mine is probably a fear and a concern that like anything where uh, revenue is involved and that's what tolling 
ultimately uh, is. Um, it's a source of revenue. Whenever you have, uh, I was in, I sit on a few com committees with elected officials and uh, they often say it does not get serious until there is actual revenue involved. And I, I fear that when we get to that point and we start talking about projections and all of those things that economists and those folks that like to look at those things do, that uh, greed, which often has its uh, you know, tentacles, if you will, in uh, pots of revenue, sources of revenue, will, will rule the day. And so I fear that uh, the work that we do will somehow be undermined at some point in favor of revenue. So we cannot uh, afford to, uh, and now I'm speaking on behalf of someone else, so we can't afford to not collect revenue from a particular group of people uh, because then that will uh, lessen uh, the, the, the revenue and will impact the bottom line. And I've seen that happen uh, on different projects time and time again. And so, I'm hoping that that is not the case, but uh, I don't see Oregon being any different than uh, some of the other places that I've been. So um, I, will, I will keep a watchful eye on that, and I hope that I will not turn to this committee at some point and say, I told you so, but uh, if it happens, you've heard it first here. Thank you so much, Dwight. Anyone else? I think that if there's any um, information on like uh, a timeline of when key decisions will be made or like important um, moments in, in, in the project's timeline, um, I think that would be really useful to know. All sorts of information will be coming to you very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> It's like, here, here's more good stuff. Oh, this is great. <laughs> so yes, you will not uh, be wanting for really understanding milestones and bumpers and options and opportunities. And, and, and so I'm going to say, I am so grateful for this conversation um on how thoughtfully everybody showed up to really speak your truth and speak your mind and um give odot the ability to listen deeply so i'm gonna in the next steps you'll see you'll be getting lots of information but i now am going to invite um lucinda broussard the director of this project and Anna Williams, the community engagement coordinator, to step forward. They're going to give us some announcements, but they're also going to give us their initial thoughts here for this evening. So I'm going to turn it over to Lucinda and Hana. Yep. If you want to unmute. <laughs> unmute. There. Go ahead, Hana. You want yeah. To go first. Yeah. Cool. Okay. How, how much time do I have for this summary, Christine? I, I took a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would love to go on to next steps at 7.45. Uh, so like 10, 12 minutes between the two of you guys. Thank you everyone for, for your thoughts this evening. Um, I didn't, I didn't stop writing. I took, I took a lot of notes and um, I even tried to take them verbatim because just what I was hearing was just really, really great. I didn't want to change anything. Um, where to start? Um, I don't know. I guess just kicking it off. Um, felt like we started the evening talking about um, intent and um, that good intent is, is not enough and that good words are, 
are not enough and that measurable outcomes are needed um, in general for change, but also for our projects. Um, and that there, uh, that we need to find solutions that meet everyone's needs. Um, that freeways have, have separated and segregated many communities and they've literally broken up communities and that they've impacted communities in, in many different ways, um, not just with um, transportation uh, and mobility, but also um, with health and safety. Um, and that this, this committee, it's, there's a great um, sense to, to really be accountable in, in your work on these projects and to, um, in your words, to, to get it right. Um, I, oh, I heard a request. I heard a request for data points and for literature about historic injustices um, that have been a result of ODOT's projects um, in, in, in this region. Um, to really be able to give the committee more background for your work. Um, I, heard, I heard comments about um, that, that there needs to be more visibility by ODOT, um, that there needs to be more transparency. And I also heard comments about thinking about um, the depth of transparency and what that means and not just, um, you know, thinking, thinking about the engagement process, um, thinking about the transportation planning um, and our transportation system. And um, I think it was Amanda gave an example of um, that sometimes decisions are already made and we go out into communities and we ask them what they think about this project and we hear that they're frankly not interested in the project. Um, and because the decision has already been made, whether it's one year ago or 20 years ago, um, the project still moves forward. So um, just reflecting on that and thinking about depth of trans transparency, that that's, um, that's something that's important to us. Um, I also heard comments um, really acknowledging that our current transportation system isn't equitable, so we're not starting at an, with a fair, equitable system. Um, and, you know, what does that mean when we think about tolls and when we think about equitable, equitable tolls? Um, you know, someone brought up a point that in order to pay a toll, um, you're going to have to be in a car. And so where, you know, where do you start with that when you're thinking about equity and tolling? Um, that there are a lot of hurdles that people have to go through to even get to that point. Um, I heard a lot of comments about just thinking about um, other modes of transportation and just mobility in general um, and improving mobility for folks. Um, I Oh, I, I heard a question. Um, I heard a question about um, the benefits of tolling and very specific, like would, would tolling benefit CTRAN and thinking about impacts to um, transit and whether, um, you know, it would be cost effective and um, provide a faster, more reliable trip for folks who are doing that and going, um, you know, across state lines. Um, I heard um, that we need to do a better job for reaching out to folks in Southwest Washington and thinking about what their needs are. Um, I I heard, um, I heard an idea for how ODOT can demonstrate that they're doing things differently, um, thinking about uh, a dedication to reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled by a certain percentage uh, within a certain time frame. Um, and then that would kind of show our commitment to, to um, you know, um, to not encouraging more cars on the road and to helping um, with climate change. Um, I heard a lot of questions about revenue and how we're gonna use the revenue and what that means and power. Um, I heard requests for more information about our project and to get real specific and to go through timelines and milestones and in point, um, points for input. Um, and also some some real questions about like what the purpose of this committee is and where your input goes and um, what you're tasked to do and um, and um, what type of power that you have. 
Um, I'm gonna check my time. I'm, and I think that's good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up with that. So thank you. Thanks, Hannah. I would say that you captured what I captured, but uh, one of the things that I noticed, which was a theme throughout, was actually the intent and the impact. And we had talked before this meeting and both Hannah and I were like, okay, so what are we gonna say? And I kept saying, we need to tell the committee, it's like, what's your purview? And where does, you, where does what you do go? It's like feedback loop is what I call it, right? A lot of people give us comments, ask us questions, but it's like, what happens to those? And, and you're sitting on the committee, what happens to what you bring back to us? So I wanna say that foremost, we're gonna have a, a you know, vice chair is on this committee. So that's straight to OTC. But your recommendation would be going to OTC. He's a member of the committee, but it would be going from you, not just from him. So that's how your information moves from here to the next place. But just some of the questions you've asked tonight are questions that we can answer that you'll find in this. When, when Christine said, we will be providing you information, we will be providing you information. You'll, you'll get information overload from us. Um, not just trying to be transparent, but actually trying to make sure that we not only give you the information, but also give you some experts who can talk about that information. So we're not just gonna give it to you and say, if you can figure it out, great. We're gonna actually give you some support for that too. We're also going to bring in an intern who can do stats for you. So that way you can get statistics, make metrics, KPIs. I mean, that way you can, you can actually keep us accountable with what we're saying we're gonna do with metrics. Um, and we'll provide that person, not our person, your person. Um, and, and you are your committee, we're not the committee. We don't provide, we provide information and that is all. But I wanna say for all the questions and all the comments you had, the sliding scale, uh, carpools, van pools, I mean, community pools, I thought those were great ideas. Um, and all of those things will come into play when we start talking about how tolling impacts people that's what tolling does it impacts people it's not about cars it's about people so we want to make sure that that's why you guys are conven convened we believe that you guys are the it's kind of like you're our brain trust um, for what we consider equity you're going to tell us what you believe is equity we're going to provide you a draft framework but it's not ours it's yours so whatever you come up with that lens is what we're expecting to see when you give us your recommendations and that's what we want to follow so i just want to say thank you for your time and I, those were tough questions. Thank you, Christine. Um, uh, tough reflections. Um, so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Honey, you want to give the next, what we're going to send you? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can give some, um, some announcements. So we're, we're going to be moving into an environmental review for the I-205 toll project. And um, with that, we'll be kicking off a 45 day comment period. And that's going to start in early August. And so we do a bunch of engagement um, before and during for that comment period. We'll also do a lot after, but specifically for the comment period. Um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So um, some things that you can look for because of COVID, we will be doing our engagement online. Um, so we have a couple different things that we're doing. We will have an online open house um, and that's gonna be in English and in Spanish. We're also going to be doing Zoom webinars and we'll be live streaming them on YouTube. Um, to try to get more folks to participate. Um, we will um, be having a survey that's paired with the webinars and also with the online open houses to really um, try to get more people's input. Um, we're also gonna be working with our community engagement liaisons to engage um, historically and currently underrepresented and underserved communities. Um, we're still working through the details for the best way to do it with um, just challenges with COVID and digital divides for really reaching people um, and just bandwidth right now um, with a lot of our community-based organizations and different communities. So um, it's probably gonna be a combination of um, a conference call and um, like just, a, it's essentially a discussion group, but it, it will be held over a conference call and maybe also paired with um, with Zoom for folks who want to see things. Um, 
And so we'll, we'll be working with folks who use I-205 and um, we'll be reaching different communities. We'll be um, hosting these, some of these discussion groups in different languages. Um, Let's see, other things that, that we're doing. Um, we'll continue to have our notifications to make sure that um, you know, information is, is really going out to inform people. So we have a monthly newsletter that we do. Um, we have one that'll be coming out um, in a couple weeks, in early July. Um, and then we also do media releases to you know, try to keep bringing people into the project, um, hopefully get them to follow our, our newsletter. Um, and then we're, we're also posting things on social media. Um, we're, we're making calls to other folks. We're, we're trying to reach out to other community-based organizations and just ask people what's the best way to engage you, what's the best way to, to engage you during COVID, how should we talk to you about tolling is now the right time to talk to you about tolling that's something that came up during the discussion um so those are those are some of the things that are um we're working on right now and will really be the core of our engagement for the comment period um, that's kicking off at the beginning of august and also we'll we'll go into much more detail and have slides um, and visuals and schedules for you um, in the in the July meeting so you can follow along and provide your input um, either you know as, as a committee but also as an individual so that's that's all for the announcement thank you <laughs> it's 745 just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> 745 we're, we're timely yes you are and and so I am going to keep us moving along I'm going to share my screen. I thank you, Lucinda. I thank you, Hanna, for your thoughtfulness, your, your deep reflection, and your ability to make sure that we're going to have all the information that we need. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So sorry about that. OK. Am I sharing the wrong side? Wrong sides. Yeah, we need presentation mode. Thank you. There we go. I'm having a tough time tonight. I apologize. All right. So, next meeting, next steps review the draft EMAC charter. Working on that, just about have it solidified. Review the draft uh, equity framework. Lots of work has gone into this with an incredible group of people. And so we want to have a conversation around that, review that. We'll look at the 2020 work plan. This will include those wonderful uh, benchmarks, those, those things that we need to hit and the time uh, line that goes with that. And then we'll discuss also how public uh, comment process should be handled. How should we look at those public comments? um that we've gotten um is a part of the meeting do we stop and read them how would you like to handle them and then our next meeting is uh tuesday july 28th with the time to be determined and so in all of my flexibility i'm giving you a poll yay um penny has popped the poll up right in in front of you. So, do you prefer future EMAC meetings to be at 3.30 in the afternoon to 6 or in the evening 5.30 to 8? You can choose one or you can choose both. So people are voting right now. And partly because I, um, I chose the 530 was to make sure that people who are not in transportation who do not do this work actually have the ability to, to attend the meetings. So that's why I was originally going with 530 in, in the evening. It looks like we have 65% at three. 
Hmm. <laughs> no way. 61% both. <laughs> no, it's a tie. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think, I think, Christine, what we might have to do is find out if, if either the afternoon session or the evening session is a barrier to any of the members, whether there's sessions that they absolutely cannot attend. And uh, we don't have that poll um, framed up, uh, probably in hindsight, would have been a good thing to do. But perhaps that's something we can check in by email. I think, I think that's a perfect solution, Penny, and I'll go ahead and send those emails out afterwards. So thank you so much. Thanks for that. So I guess we can hop out of the poll and into the next slide, which is welcome to public comment. Um, you have up to two minutes to speak. Please raise your virtual hand so Penny can unmute you when she calls on you. Um, please speak about today's topic. If you're on an iPad or an iPhone, tap your screen to bring up the menu to find your raise hand. If you've joined by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand if you're not on the app. And again, remember you can provide comments at any time through the email, oregontolling at odot.state.or.us and please include EMAC public comments in the subject line. And you can also call 503-837-3534. And please state EMAC public comment. So do we have any people who would like to participate in public comment? And I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I do not have anybody yet. Okay. I'm watching. And again, if you're in the audience and you'd like to make public comment, just go to the participants list and find the option to raise your hand and that way we'll know to call on you. I do not have anybody, Christine. Then you guys get nine minutes back. <laughs> In deep gratitude to all of you who have participated this evening, I thank you so, so much. And again, lots of information coming to you. I'll circle back to you guys around um, meeting times and see if we can find something that fits the most people. And again, I just really wanna say thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Good night, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, yeah, good night. everyone. Nice job, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye, thank you. Bye.